Today we're going to be reviewing the Nissan Qashqai, also known as the Rogue Sport. Now while most car reviewers would complain that 141 horsepower and a CVT transmission isn't fast enough to drop the kids off to school, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this Qashqai to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood where we have Nissan's MR20 DD inline 4 cylinder 2 liter engine. Now it's situated on the passenger side transversely because this is a front wheel drive platform and underneath on the driver's side here we have a a CVT transmission. Now taking a general look of the layout under the hood here, on this side we've got the washer tank and coolant reservoir. The back there we have the ABS module. Over here we have the master cylinder. At the back there is where the air box and air filter is located. And then underneath this giant duct here is the battery. Now the air intake setup on the cash K is actually quite interesting. Cool air is going to come in from the front of the vehicle here and then make its way up this duct here into this air resonator box. Now most automakers would bury that down in the fender, but Nissan's chosen to put it right on top of of the battery here. The air is then going to make its way over to this air box here where it's going to get filtered out. It'll then pass by this mass airflow sensor and then come into this tube here. Now on top of the engine we have yet another resonator box just sitting there. So if I move that out of the way you can see the air is going to make its way to this drive-by wire throttle body here and then into this plastic intake plenum and then go through these little channels over here for each cylinder back to the front of the engine to go into the engine head to get burned. So as you can see that this is a very long intake track that the air has to take before it goes in. Most automakers just situate the airbox right here and the throttle body next to the intake plenum for a very short path to the engine. Now the downside to having this airbox on top of everything is that you have to remove it in order to access the computers on either side, the battery, the fuse box, and even to change the air filter. Now it's not exactly a tool-less design. Once you remove this little clip here and then you undo this clip over here, you kind of pop it straight up out of the airbox. And then you have access to the air filter. Now even with that out of the way, changing the air box means you gotta pull these two tabs here. And then you kind of have to slide the air filter out this way. This one is really, really dirty. Now a lot of other automakers have come up with much easier ways to change the air filter than this. In order to remove this air box, you've actually got to remove this computer. And to remove the computer, you've got to remove this battery. So that's a lot of work. Now at the bottom here, we've got the air intake runner control system, which manages a series of flaps inside of this plenum to help promote mixing and more power at different RPM. Now looking at the fuel system on the cash K, this is a direct injected engine only. There is no port injection up at the front here. That means that the gasoline is going to come from the low pressure pump in the tank here through this line over here. It's then going to come to this high pressure fuel pump which is powered off of the exhaust camshaft. It's going to pressurize that gasoline and send it through this pipe over here down to the fuel rail underneath this air intake plenum. And here's a closer look at that fuel rail which is going to take that fuel to the direct injectors and inject it directly into the combustion chamber. Over here we have the pressure sensor for the fuel pressure. Now at the top here we have the purge valve for the EVAP control system. Taking a look at the top of the engine here, we have a plastic valve cover. Buried in between there, we have these ignition coils. Now it looks like these ignition coils can be removed and you can change spark plugs fairly easily. Although the repair manual does call for you to remove this air intake plenum, which is a lot of work because there's a lot of stuff connected to this thing. So you can see that having an intake plenum like this is actually detrimental to a four cylinder engine, which is supposed to be easy to work on to access things like spark plugs and even the valve cover gaskets. But in this case, it's gonna be a lot more work involved, more like a V6 engine where you have the plenum covering half the engine. Now on the top of the valve cover we have this PCV valve which is integrated and goes to the hose which attaches to the resonator on top of the engine. There's no separate oil collector. Now the cash K does take 0W20 weight oil with the dipstick located over here. Taking a look underneath the cash K you can see that the front part here has a flat cover which is great for aerodynamics and to prevent salt water from corroding your powertrain components. Now further behind that we've got these two parts here that are uncovered in the midsection and in the back section here is covered so I'm not sure why they didn't cover the whole thing. The exhaust is also uncovered completely, but then again, this is an economy SUV, so you can definitely tell where they've cut corners. One thing I don't like is you got to remove this whole cover in order to change your oil, which means that those clips that hold it on do tend to break away pretty quickly. You also can't really tell if you've got an oil leak because this thing's just going to absorb it all. Now with that cover removed, we have clear access to the engine on this side and the transmission on this side. Now once that cover is removed, changing oil is pretty easy. We have a spin-on style canister oil filter here. There's no cartridges to deal with and the drain plug is located over here. Accessing the oil pan itself should be pretty straightforward. There's nothing blocking the way if you need to change the gasket 
or access the engine from below. Now the upper oil pan integrates the oil pump and that's on the timing side of the engine above this lower oil pan. Now over here on the passenger side of the engine underneath this cover here is a timing chain and that's good because you don't have to service it over the life of the vehicle. Now the back side here we have the exhaust camshaft and on the front side here we've got the intake camshaft. It's all buried under this bracket for the engine mount. Now each of these camshafts do have variable valve timing. Now they are oil controlled and you can see the oil control valve over here on the intake side and over here on the exhaust side. Now just in front of that timing chain is the drive belt setup. Now here you can see the alternator with the drive belt. The tensioner is located at the back here. The water pump and AC compressor is located down below. Now to change this drive belt you'd reach in from the bottom here, put your tensioner on this hex bolt and turn it in order to get the belt off. Now while that alternator looks easily accessible you do have to remove these AC lines and this washer tank and in order to do that you got to remove the whole front bumper. So changing the alternator is not exactly an easy job. From underneath here you can see you've got the AC compressor. Now removing it shouldn't be too difficult. There's just a couple of bolts here that hold it to the engine block and it should pop down out of the bottom. And now we'll have a listen to the startup sound. Now the cash kit has three main engine mounts. We've got the one on the passenger side over here and on the driver's side just behind the battery you've got the other one on top of the transmission. Now the third engine mount is underneath the vehicle and secures the subframe to the transmission over here. It's only to prevent the whole assembly from rocking back and forth. It doesn't bear any load. Now the cash kit has its fair share of electronics under the hood like any modern vehicle. Now the part that I dislike the most is over this part here where it's cluttered with electronics. At the front here you have the ECU and at the back there we have the transmission control unit. Now these are all open to the elements and open to heat under the hood and subject to any collision impact because it's right at the front here. Now accessing the fuse boxes on the cash K is actually a little difficult because this car is so compact under the hood. This cover is going to pop off like this and then once that cover is off I can remove this smaller L-shaped cover and that reveals a couple of relays. There's no fuses in here though. This is actually a junction box. If you turn it over you have a couple of fuses here. But I don't think this is all the fuses for this vehicle. Too bad it says here discard if dropped. I wonder how you're going to drop this with all these wires attached to it though. Now if we take a look at that CVT transmission, which in Nissan's is notorious to fail, it's located underneath the battery here so there's not much that we can see. Although it does come with a hole for a dipstick, you still have to purchase the dipstick separately. You don't get that with the vehicle. Down underneath here you can see we've got the cooling lines to bring coolant into this transmission cooler over here. And underneath here it does use a cable to manually switch gears instead of an electric electronic switcher. Now accessing the starter can be done from above because there's a lot of room between the cooling fans and the engine here. The starter is located on this side of the bell housing just held on by two bolts over here and your electrical connection. Now taking a look at that CVT transmission from below you can see you've got those coolant lines that are going to come into the transmission over here to cool the fluid off. At the bottom here we have the drain pan and here we've got the drain bolt. Now in order to fill this transmission the manual specifies that you remove this bolt and put a special adapter here with a pump that's going to pump transmission fluid in here then you got to check it at a certain temperature the excess will drain out. Now as you can see this is not much higher than this so there's not really going to be much transmission fluid sitting in this pan. Now the engine's torque is going to go from the CVT transmission and change its ratio. The output will then come to the differential located at the back here. You've got one shaft that's going to go over to that driver wheel over there. Then on the other side we have this transfer case. Now this transfer case is for the all-wheel drive system and it's going to take power and translate it to this prop shaft going to the back. Servicing the transfer case is pretty straightforward. We've got a fill plug over here and a drain plug located over here. And here you can see where that prop shaft joins up to the transfer case over here. It's got a universal join over here and then that drive shaft runs along the length of the vehicle to the back. Now that drive shaft is going to bring its power down to the back here where we have the rear differential. Now in this part of the housing at the front here we've got this electronic module that's going to turn on and off the all-wheel drive system according to the slippage of the front wheel. Inside of here there's a set of clutches that are going to electronically actuate in order to enable the rear drives to turn. So instead of doing everything up at the front of the transfer case it's all done back here now. Now servicing that rear differential is pretty easy. You got your drain port and your fill port right at the back here. Now coming out of the differential we have these axles. Now these axles are pretty small so they're only going to take part-time duty such as hop in the curb at your school parking lot on a rainy day. Taking a look at the exhaust setup on the back of this cash case engine we have a typical steel exhaust manifold. It's not integrated into the head or anything and you've got your Oh my god, I lost my toothbrush. You got your air fuel sensor over here and you've got an integrated catalytic converter before the exhaust flows down underneath the vehicle. Now looking from the bottom, we've got the tail end of the catalytic converter as it goes into the flex pipe. The exhaust gas is then going to travel into the secondary cat and then out to the back. Now that exhaust is going to travel through this resonator in the middle here and then out the back here to the muffler. Now the muffler itself has a single inlet here 
and an outlet only on the left side here. There is no hidden exhaust on the rear bumper, which is good. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Now taking a look at the front suspension setup on the cash K, we've got a McPherson strut suspension here. What do you expect in this class? Over here we have the tie-in for the stabilizer link and a steel steering knuckle. You can see it's already starting to surface rust. Now from the back here, we've got the sway bar link, which is gonna tie in at the strut at the top here, as well as the bottom here to the sway bar that goes over to the other side. Now at the bottom here, we've got this stamped steel lower control arm and it's pretty easy to replace. We've got easy access to the bolts over here and at the back here. And here we've got your inner and outer tie rod. Now taking a look at the front suspension from behind here you can see you've got these steel knuckles with a bolted on style ball joint which is good because you don't need a press to change it out at the bottom here we have a little tiny ball joint and that ball joints pressed into the control arm so you'd have to get a press to change that out or you could change the whole entire control arm you can see this control arm is just a stamped steel piece there's no reinforcements or anything running across one thing I do dislike about the suspension is that it uses a pinch bolt to pinch the strut these are known to weld together with rust over time and you're gonna be really difficult to get this out when you need to replace that strut. Now overall this suspension is going to be pretty easy to work on and easy to replace parts when things do wear out. However, you shouldn't expect it to outhandle your teacher's Volkswagen Beetle. Now the rear suspension on the cash key is actually really interesting. It's a multi-link design, which is pretty good for this class. However, if we take a look at the links here, we've got the upper control arm over here. We have a lower control arm down at the bottom there. We've even got a little stabilizer link here that ties into that lower control arm. We have the shock located at the back here. And it's really missing a link for the spring here because this spring is actually joined to the trailing arm. That's right, the trailing arm is actually integrated with the spring and the steering knuckle. Now, now the knuckle itself is made of stamped steel, so it's integrated all together as one piece. There's no cast piece for this knuckle. So this trailing arm is essentially doing double duty by holding up the weight of the vehicle, and it also ties into that bushing on the body there and pivots up and down, the same way a torsion beam design would. Taking another look at the suspension, this flat spot here is for the bump stop. Now this upper arm here is the only one that's made of aluminum. The rest of the arms here are all made of steel, so this is probably shared across another platform or another vehicle. Now the stabilizer bar link is actually a unique S shape because it has to curve around the drive shaft to plug into that lower control arm. Now replacing the shock is going to be pretty easy at the bottom here with just one bolt tying it to that steel knuckle. However, looking up at the top here, this bolt here is pretty difficult to access, although it can be pulled out on the side here without dropping this subframe. Overall, though, I'm pretty impressed that the cash K at this price point is giving you an independent rear suspension, which should lend to better handling. However, working on this thing is going to be a little difficult when parts do wear out. Now looking at that rear suspension from underneath, it's a bit difficult to see, but it does use a bolt-on style rear bearing here, which is going to be pretty easy to change out because you don't have to use a press. Now here's another look at that sway bar link as it goes into the arm over here, and it connects the sway bar, which is bolted up to the sub frame as it goes over to the other side. Now the rear subframe back here is made of stamped steel. I wouldn't expect aluminum at this price point. Now it's good to know that Nissan does offer a camera adjustment from the factory. So if you want to give your cash guy that stanced look, you can adjust it right here. Now the cash guy is sitting on a pretty old platform and it kind of shows. You have a full box subframe here made of stamped steel that runs the whole front of the vehicle across the side over here and then around the back to form a full box shape. Most other automakers are just getting away with putting a tie in the back here and having nothing supporting the front here for weight savings. I'm actually quite surprised because although there's a steel subframe right here, they're also using a fully steel radiator support, which is pretty rare in modern vehicles. Most vehicles are getting away with using composite plastics now. But at least that's a good thing because you can jack up your car from this subframe at the front here as long as you can get through that plastic cover that sits here. Now, although steel is cheaper and at this price point it is justified, you can see the downsides here are rust. This subframe here is starting to show some surface rust all along these edges here where the welds are and even the control arm here is getting some rust on these stamped steel components. So your typical Nissan rust problems are already starting to show on an almost new car here so make sure you rust proof if you get one of these. Now next we're going to look at the cooling system on the cash K. Now we got this cap here. There's no actual radiator cap on the radiator itself. This functions as the fill port. Now taking a look inside of here, the coolant is then going to travel into the thermostat housing located inside of here. Now here we've also got this lower radiator hose that goes into here. Changing out the thermostat is really straightforward. We've just got a couple of bolts here and the housing pops off and we get to the thermostat. It's actually on the back of the water pump which is located underneath the alternator. Here's a look at that thermostat housing from down below. 
You can see this also has a plastic union before it goes into the water pump on the other side. Now that lower radiator hose is then going to join over to the radiator on that side. Up at the top here we have this upper radiator hose here that's going to bring coolant over to this side of the engine. Now where that upper coolant hose joins to the block here we have a water outlet and that's going to share all the warm coolant with other things like your transmission warmer lines over here and the heater core lines at the back here that go into the cabin. There's also a water temperature sensor for your dashboard reading. Now the only thing I'm not a fan of is that it's actually made of plastic so we'll see how those hold up over time. Now just behind the radiator we have a single cooling fan that cools it off. Now there is a lot of space here between the engine and the radiator which means that removing the radiator and its fans shouldn't be too hard. However because this radiator is so far forward into the bumper it does require you to remove the bumper when you're changing the radiator. Once you remove this bracket here it should slide straight up. Here's a look at the cooling setup from down below. We've got that radiator fan located more on the driver's side. On the passenger side, they've just blocked off parts of the intake here, so it channels the air through the fan. Now also integrated into the oil filter housing is an oil cooler, so that's going to bring coolant over here to circulate with the oil to cool things down. Taking a look at the braking system on the cash cave, you've got a fairly short stroke master cylinder here, especially when you compare it to the size of this reservoir. The rest of it's fairly traditional though, we've got a vacuum brake booster over here. Now if you follow that vacuum line, it actually comes over here to the air intake plenum, which means that you don't need a vacuum pump to power that brake booster. Now if we follow the lines from the master cylinder, it'll actually go to the back here to the ABS module, which is responsible for the traction, stability, and autonomous braking features of this vehicle. Luckily they don't put any sensors at the bottom here otherwise you can easily hit it and break it when you run over a soccer ball at your local kiss and ride. Taking a look at the front brakes on the cash case just a simple single piston floating caliper design with a disc rotor. The only thing I wish is they improved the coating here so the rust doesn't show as badly. Taking a look at the rear brakes on the cash case we've got a floating caliper design with a disc rotor. Now inside of that rotor we have a drum that integrates the parking brake. Now things are pretty old school here because you've got a cable activated drum brake that actually is going to push out against the drum to lock the wheel. There's no electronic actual over here or anything even integrated the caliper. Now the cash case steering setup is pretty straightforward. We've got a column mounted electric motor. We've got the shaft that's going to come down to the steering rack and that's going to go out to the tire rods to each wheel. Now if you follow the steering column all the way up inside the dash you can see this is where the EPS motor is. Now the back rear quarter of the cash car inside of the rear bumper is where the EVAP canister is located. Now the fuel tank is a two-part design because it has to go over the hump of the drive shaft so you've got one section of it with the fuel pump on this side and the other side underneath that heat shield where the exhaust is. Underneath the rear seat here we've got the fuel pump on this side and on that side we have the sending unit. Now overall the build quality of the Kashka is just average for its class. It does have its share of scratchy plastics on the interior here, but what do you expect for $20,000? I personally do like the interior layout. Now under the hood I am impressed that they do give you a metal radiator support and framework underneath and the option to have a CVT dipstick. Most vehicles just seal the CVT nowadays. Then again this does ride on a fairly dated platform. However I do think under the hood Nissan's got some improvement to do with this air intake setup in terms of accessing things like your battery, fuses, airbox, spark plugs, and even the alternator without disassembling half the top of the vehicle. After all, this is a Japanese economy SUV, something that you buy to be cheap to easy to work on and maintain. Otherwise, you could have just gone with a German turbocharged engine or maybe even a V6 Murano, which would have been more complicated than this. Now you tell me in the comment section down below, what do you think of the Rogue Sport or Cash K? Would you put your kids in this to take them to school? Or is this just another take on a regular CUV? Make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next car review is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one.